Suzanne, welcome back. Would you like to begin reading chapter one, number one, Halakha one on page 43. Okay, basic principles. Yes. Chapter one. The basic principle of all basic <coughs> principles and the pillar of all sciences is to realize that there is a first being who brought every existing thing into being. All existing things, whether celestial, ter terrestrial, or belonging to an intermediate class, exist only through his true existence. In other words, um, this is the most important, and notice it, he uses the term uh, first, first being, being, right? And um, in other words, the foundation, okay? Uh, and uh, let's keep reading, go ahead. If it could be supposed that he did not exist, it would follow that nothing else could possibly exist. In other words, everything is dependent upon his existence, but his existence is not dependent on anything else. In other words, everything is contingent upon his existence, but he is not contingent on anything. Read on. If, however, it were supposed that all other beings were non-existent, he alone would still exist. Their non-existence would not involve his non-existence. For all beings are in need of him, but he, blessed be he, is not in need of them, nor of any one of them. Hence, his real essence is unlike that of any of them. Okay, so that's, that's, his, that's one of his critical points. That God is unlike <coughs> any of his creations. And by the way, I'm using the masculine because that's what he uses, but of course he didn't believe that, that God had any gender. Um, and as we will see, that is a very critical philosophical point for him, that God is totally uh, unlike anything else. He gets to understand that metaphorically, the image of God. I mean, he's going to reinterpret biblical language metaphorically. In fact, the whole first part of the guide of the, per, of the perplexus devoted to that. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's the important thing. Okay, uh, let us read number four. This is what the prophet means when he says, but the eternal is the true God, Jeremiah. That is, he alone is real and nothing else has reality like his reality. The same thought the Torah expresses in the text, there is none else besides him, Deuteronomy. That is, there is no being besides him that is really like him. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, he traces in, in, the, in one that, uh, for some reason I left it out of the extra sections, uh, he traces that in number five uh, to, you learn this as a positive mitzvah, and he quotes, um, uh, well, actually it is here. Um, I'm trying to remember what is it. Uh, you know what the problem is, the, the Hebrew text the way from the Mamre is a little different than what the one that Tversky's working over, the, new, the numbering of it. Um, okay, well, let's, let's read number six. Okay. To acknowledge this truth is an affirmative precept, as it said, I am the Lord your God, Exodus and Deuteronomy. And whoever permits the thought to enter his mind that there is another deity besides this God violates a prohibition, as it is said, you shall have no other gods before me, Exodus and Deuteronomy, and denies the essence of religion, this doctrine being the great principle on which everything depends. Okay, the part that's missing actually is he talks about how uh, God is the one who is the mover of the, is the, is the mover but not the one who is moved. And he talks about moving the, the, the cycle, the great, uh, the great spheres, okay? Um, and... Uh, so he, that's where he specifically, um, within the astronomy, talks about God as the unmoved mover. Okay, And so here, this is very typical for Maimonides. He does a lot of biblical quotes to prove, he uses, notice, he hasn't quoted a single rabbinic text so far. Um, it's all biblical. Um, and here he is now, in number six, he's, very, he's specifying which verses in the Torah this commandment is based on. So naturally, the beginning of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God, which the Jewish tradition interprets as the first commandment. Therefore, the first commandment is the acknowledgement of the, the single idea that God is the creator uh, of the universe on which the whole universe is dependent. But notice, he doesn't really push the... He, doesn't, he hasn't actually said creation yet here, unlike he did um, in... Uh, 
uh, in his 13 principles of faith. He just says here um, that God is the, the prime mover, the first cause. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, in the extra sections, number seven. Harvey, do you want to want to read that one? This is on page one because I think it's worthwhile sort of keeping it keeping it go. It's on the extra sections from the Mishnah oh, Torah. Yeah, sure. First page, number seven. Halakha number seven. This God is one. He is not two or more, but one, unified in a manner which surpasses any unity that is found in the world. He is not one in the manner of a general category, which includes many entities, nor one in the, uh, in the way that the, the body is divided into different portions and dimensions. Rather, he is unified. There exists no unity similar to his in this world. Notice his comparison to the human body. The human body is a, you're going to talk about a single body, but it has many parts. To him, God's unity is not merely numerical, but unified in its essence, right? There are no um, sort of parts, there are no parts of God, okay? And therefore, this kind of unity <coughs> does not exist anywhere in the world because every entity in the world is made up of parts, even if it's a singular entity. God is not that. So here, he is interpreting the Lord is one of the Shema, not only to mean there, is, there are no other gods, but there is no entity like this God in its oneness. And I think that's a really important point. And then notice he goes on and says, if there were many gods, they would have body and form. In other words, there would be, you know, they each have, in order for there to be more than one God, they have to have, they have to have some kind of body. They have to have some kind of form. Well, they'd have to be different. Yes, to be different, exactly. Have to be some. Exactly. And then, Harvey, pick it up where it says, we're the creator. We're the creator to have body and form. He would have, fun he had a, he would have limitation and definition because it's impossible for a body not to be limited. And any entity which itself is limited and defined possesses only limited and defined power. You see, you notice he uses body and form. Here he's using the platonic categories, right? There is a form, and then there is you know, which is kind of like the basic template for all entities. And then there is the body, the matter, which makes up that form, right? So if God had a body and form, all right, uh, he would have to be limited because bodies are limited. Um, interestingly enough, this translation, which, as I said, comes off of the uh, Chabad site, um, uses, the term, um, uses the term creator here. Um, and I'm not sure that's exactly what is used in the Hebrew. Yeah, Yotzer. Yeah, Yotzer? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the point is, this, this I guess would be the first time he actually uses that term in the text. Mm -hmm. And read on, Harvey, since our so, God... Since our God, blessed be his name, possesses unlimited power, as evidenced by the continuous revolution of the sphere, we see that his power is not the power of a body, since he is not a body. The circumstances associated with bodies that produce division and separation are not relevant to him. Therefore, it is impossible for him to be anything other than one. The knowledge of this concept fulfills a positive commandment as implied by Deuteronomy. Here, Israel, God is uh, our Lord, God is one. There it is. In other words, it's not just numerical, but a sense of unity. Okay? So for him, this is a very critical idea. It's the foundation of, of a lot of what he believes. He was grasping this from his thought processes. Correct. Yes, well, he's influenced by well, Aristotelian mean. notions of God through Muslim uh, philosophers. Wasn't that what got him in trouble, though? Relying on well, yeah, <laughs> that got him in trouble that, that he started this way at all. And I'm, we're going to look at a comparison uh, to, uh, to Yehuda Halevi. Uh, a, a very, very different than most traditional, well, not from Jewish philosophers per se, but in some ways he is the most mm -hmm. radical of the philosophers up till his time in that respect. Yes, Brian? What strikes me is that he's effecting a fusion between traditional, the teachings of traditional <laughs> authority and the sacred texts. Absolutely. And I guess what then was still considered modern philosophy, a rationalism and a framework and a categorization of the uh, 
entities in the universe. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's fusing them together before Aquinas did, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. He's in one of the major influences on Aquinas. In other words, when you look at the history of how philosophy enters into the Western religions, you could say that Philo was the first, back in the first century. Then the church fathers begin to incorporate Greek philosophy into early Christian ideas. Um, Philo was one of their major sources for that, but they were also had access to the originals. And then through the mediation of the, of the Syriac Christians, uh, Muslims began to read this classical literature, comment on it, write their own stuff, try to bring it in conformity with their theological ideas, and then from there it passed into Judaism uh, through beginning a little, you know, around the time of Sa'aja. Sa'aja writes the first major work in the uh, 10th century, and then it just goes on from there, and you have a whole series of Jewish attempts to grapple with um, philosophy. But by then, it's a it's the it's it's well known. It's a it's a it's well known in Jewish and and in Muslim circles, and has begun to infiltrate into Christian circles as well. I mean, it's already there in Christian circles, but um, the the more the, the closer to the Greek ideas begins to move into Christian circles. So that by the time of Aquinas, again, it is this major area of study um, within Christian theology, and he of course becomes. Like he becomes like the Maimonides for Christianity in many ways. Well, yeah. What fascinates me about this is that, with one exception, no modern cosmologist or astronomer would have any objection to what he says. The single, this truly, the single point at which they might disagree if they were to talk is the question of intention that I think Maimonides and the people of his time yeah. would have said that everything was created by an intention right. of God. But if you talk to a modern cosmologist about the Big Bang and what happened before that, and <coughs> has anything happened since that, and so on, modern science fits right in with this. It's a, such a pleasure to see that. I will say that science, because I've studied this quite a bit, I would say that science um, is suggestive of things, and there are a few scientists who are willing to do what you're saying, but one of the fascinating things is how much scientists want to avoid the concept of a first cause, because they know if there's a first cause, that would be a god. In other words, uh, 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 you know, that's one of the things that Stephen Hawking tries to avoid in his, his, his uh, physics, that there is no first cause. And it's one of the reasons why I think cosmologists are trying to look at the notion of what they call internal inf inflation, that this particular universe had a beginning in the Big Bang, but it was a bubbling off of an eternal process of universes bubbling off from which there was no beginning. So they're trying to get back to the Aristotle notion of an eternal universe with no creation because they're, and one of the reasons is, is that they don't want to evoke the G word, because for them that's illegitimate science. So we have to be careful well, when we talk about science and religion, because there are many areas where um, some scientists and some theologians, sometimes in one person, have had a very interesting dialogue, but most mainstream physicists today are either atheists or agnostics, and they really want to try and avoid anything that smacks of theology. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure, I know that. but in my experience through reading and conversation and so on, what they generally say, if you say, well, what was before the Big Bang? They'll say, we don't know. before inflation. Right. right. They'll say, that's not a scientific question, exactly. that's a theological well, question. Well, they'll say it's a metaphysical question, and that's, yeah. that's interesting itself. Sam, you had a point. Um, this is a difficult question, but what do you say to people, how, how should people relate to this? If they, if they don't take the Bible literally, or if they have serious doubts about the existence of a supernatural being, how, can, how could they relate to all these things which we're reading and talking about? Well, we are reading a medieval thinker, so a lot has changed since then, right? And so, um, just because, you know, a medieval philosopher said this isn't necessarily going to convince a modern thinking uh, agnostic or atheist.
But nonetheless, some of the questions and issues that Maimonides uh, <coughs> talks about, which were live issues in his day, are still live issues today, although obviously there are a lot of differences because of the increases in science. Um, and that's one of the more interesting reasons for studying this. Um, is there a first cause to the universe, right? Um, is there something that lies behind some kind of order that lies behind the, the universe, or is the universe just is because it is? There is no uh, order behind it. There's no, um, I'm going to use the word very carefully, design behind it, so to speak, right? Um, there are those who will say the universe just is because it is. There's no meaning to be found beyond its existence itself. I don't personally find that a satisfactory answer. I think that's a bit of an evasion, but I respect the fact that there are people who believe that. Yes, Cantor? But where did the Greek um, took their... Where did they get their... Where did they get their idea from? It was from their own evolution of what we would call a combination of science, theology, and philosophy all wrapped together. I'm Don't forget, no, 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 they, they, this is one of the areas where the Greeks actually, I mean, they got some of their sciences like geometry from the Egyptians and astronia, astronomy from the Babylonians, but the evolution of Greek philosophy in itself is, a, is, is, is unique to, um, to Greece, although there are some uh, theorists who believe that some of the people who are considered the earliest Greek scientists may in fact have been um, Semitic, not Greek. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's what deep thinking Greeks were trying to get away from their own uh, mythology of the gods mm -hmm. to something deeper. And, uh, but don't forget, they didn't have a concept of revelation the way the Jews did with the notion of Torah. Right. So, they, so the so the, the, the mountain with the views yeah. over there, that was just there. Yeah. Well, but they tried to evolve. They had different different theories evolved um, through what they call the pre-Socratics, and then through the line of Socrates and uh, Plato and Aristotle and many others to try and understand. They came to what you would call a philosophical monotheism, but their god was not an entity, a being like the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, uh, about how Maimonides seems, as I said, blends these two concepts of God, the biblical idea of God with the philosophical idea but of God. What about the East? Uh, was there any interaction? There may have been. Uh, there, there was, because there was trade with India, there certainly was probably some interaction with uh, aspects of Hinduism and later on Buddhism, but that's a very complex topic, mm -hmm. of which I only know very little. Yeah, it's the Sam's question. It would seem to me that if one is a doubter, or questions and so forth, a non-believer, reading this should be like looking at art. That uh, the concepts that you see on the canvas may not be what you believe or recognize as being today, but uh, you can appreciate what's there. Yes, yes, you can. I, I, I think that's 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 interesting. Um, let's just go on to number eight, because there he's going to give you his biblical proofs for God not having a body. This itself is quite fascinating. Um, whose turn is it to read? Uh, Justin, is it your turn? Eight, you said? Number eight, yes. Uh, in the book. Oh, in the, the book. book. Sorry, okay. That the Holy One, blessed be he, is not a physical body, is, explicit, is, is explicitly set forth in the Pentateuch and in the prophets, as it is said. Know therefore that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, Deuteronomy. And a physical body in, is not in two places at, any, at one time. Furthermore, it is said, for you saw no manner of simulite. Similitude. Simulite. And again, it is said, to whom then will you liken me, or shall I equal? Uh, if, he, if he were a body, he would be like other bodies. Okay, here he is selectively quoting, and notice Deuteronomy especially is one of his sources, because in fact, Deuteronomy is very big. Uh, it, it, uh, amongst biblical traditions, the Deuteronomic uh, tradition is very... Um, uh, strict monotheistic, um, and therefore Maimonides often finds a lot of his 
uh, you know, his understandings in Deuteronomy and also in the prophets. But he's being, of course, he's doing a kind of philosophical midrash here. He, and this is typical for him. He has stated the premise that God does not have a body. Now he's quoting you biblical verses to show this is supported by the Bible. Well, of course, uh, I, I, I remember I mentioned to you last week that the Provence <laughs> rabbi, the Rivad, who immediately upon the publication of the Mishnah Torah um, uh, began... Uh, making comments on it uh, every once in a while. He makes a little critique. This is precisely the point where he puts in a con his first comment to say, this is not true. There are many great thinkers who thought that God had a body. Um, uh, my particular edition of the Mishnah Torah didn't, uh, didn't have um, that um, statement, <laughs> but I will find it for you and uh, send it to you. Um, uh, in, in an email because it's quite fascinating. I mean, here's a, 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 a Talmudist in southern France, who, by the way, is one of the early Kabbalistic thinkers, who is disagreeing with one of Maimonides' basic premise that God doesn't have a body. Um, and in fact, um, you know, if you look at the Bible, there are many streams of thought in the, the biblical text which actually did believe God did have some kind of body uh, because they weren't, you know, they didn't, weren't bothered by anthropomorphisms because their concept of deity was a lot more physical than we, than in the time of Maimonides, which saw the notion of spirit and as being, this again is from the Greeks, as being pure and above the changeable matter. Uh, but in, in many streams of early biblical thought, heaven is a physical place. God is a physical being, albeit not like us, right? And extremely powerful. And they didn't get into this issue of limitations and forms and things like that. So Maimonides is really going out on a limb here. But of course this has, was... This is what Jewish philosophy had been doing already for centuries before him. It is interesting at this point to compare what Yehuda Halevi said. And if you go to um, the, um, page, the second page of the background material I gave you, Yehuda Halevi, of course, was the great Jewish uh, poet of medieval Spain, um, lived before Maimonides. Um, when he died, Maimonides was only a few years old, still living in Spain. And in addition to his poetry, Yuda Levy is known for his great, um, this is the page I gave you to, that I sent out yesterday. Um, oh, yeah. Second side. Second side. Uh, he wrote a great philosophical treatise called the Kuzari, or Kuzari. And um, Yehuda Halevi, part of his, his job in this is to criticize Aristotelian philosophy. Okay? Uh, he himself, of course, was influenced by other forms of philosophy, but one of his great critiques is that um, of trying to say that, you know, the philosophical concept of God is not necessarily in conformity um, with the classical Jewish concept coming out of the Bible and the rabbis. And it's stated very clearly at the beginning. Now, the premise of the Kuzari is that the king of the Khazars, which was a Turkish uh, tribe living between the Black Sea and the Caucasus, who had established a kingdom in that area. This was before the Russians, the Rus, came down to that area. For several centuries, they had a rather large uh, kingdom there that was kind of between Christians and Muslims. And at one point, the king of the Khazars converted to Judaism. We know this to be a historical fact. Um, we don't know exactly why he did it. We don't know how many of the Khuzar uh, Khazarians became Jewish, was it just the upper class? But it was for a short while, a few, well not short while, a few centuries, a Jewish kingdom. Yes, Brian? There's a midrash about this, that the king invited representatives. That's not the midrash, that's the Khuzari. That's the Khuzari. Yes, this is, this is, in other words, there is a story that he invited, um, that he invited various representatives, different religions to come, and he picked Judaism. What Yehuda Halevi does is, is he takes that legend and he expands it into uh, a dialogue between the king and a rabbi. So at the beginning of the Kuzari, the, the king has a dream which says, you know, he tries to be a good king, where he hear, gets a kind of personal revelation where God comes to him and says, you know, your intentions are good, but your actions are not. Um, and so he goes out and he, he listens to a Greek, uh, to a philosopher, he listens to a, a Christian, he listens to a Muslim, and he finds fault with all of their positions. 
and he realizes that the Muslims and the Christians are basing their ideas on the Hebrew Bible. So even though at the beginning he had decided not to talk to a Jew because they're despised and they're lowly, he brings in a rabbi and he says to, listen, look at what he says. Um, and Justin, you want to you want to read this? And so Al Khaziri is the king of. The oh, all right. So George wanted to pick it up. Uh, okay, Al Khaziri. Indeed, if I I see myself compelled to ask the Jews because they are the relic of the children of Israel, for I see that they constitute in themselves the evidence for the divine law on earth. He then invited a Jewish rabbi and asked him about his belief. <clears throat> The rabbi replied, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt with signs and miracles, who fed them in the desert and gave them the land, after having made them traverse the sea and the Jordan in a miraculous way, who sent Moses with his law, and subsequently thousands of prophets who confirmed his law by promises to the observant and threats to the disobedient. Our belief is comprised in the Torah, a very large domain. 